You're listening to the Native Plants Healthy Planet Podcast, presented by Pinelands Nursery. Here are your hosts, Fran Chismar and Tom Knezic. I have been vindicated. Welcome back to the Native Plants Healthy Planet Podcast presented by Pinelands Nursery. I am Fran Chismar. And I'm Tom Knezic. And today we're going to be joined by Mike Van Clef of the New Jersey Invasive Species Strike Team and Friends of Hopewell Valley Open Space. But, uh, but Fran, I'd still got a bone to pick with you over those <laughs> those results on our <laughs> like, Facebook like, poll. Um, there's, what, it, all right. So after we, we published the results and that we, we stated that where you could vote for Tom, it disappeared on Facebook, and we assumed it was foul play, and one of us had accidentally deleted it. It showed back up after we, after, we yeah, after the poll, the voting was done. But All listen, of a sudden it was there again. I can't make that happen. I don't work with Facebook. I can't make things disappear and reappear. Like I could have deleted it, but it wouldn't have shown back up. That just vindicated <laughs> me to prove that there was no foul play yeah. on my. I'm now, not sure if you submitted a request to Mark Zuckerberg and like <laughs> called for a favor or something <laughs> like that. Well, you know we are besties, yeah. so this <laughs> is possible. So. No, it's just it. It was. I will say it's weird timing that it disappeared yeah. the day before and then showed up after we yep. announced Yeah, right it, so. after I called for some more votes to break our tie, <laughs> which did work. We did break the tie. We, we did break the tie. Now, didn't go my way. That for the next buzz, I will say you have – I'm a little disappointed because you did say <laughs> this was a popular, popularity contest, yeah. the next one, yeah. and you're crushing me. I yeah. don't even have a vote <laughs> <laughs> as of yet. So the, the group has spoken. So – um I, I'm totally lost. I don't even know what <laughs> – I got so enthralled with, <laughs> <laughs> with, with the politics. Yeah. Uh, so – we You wanted to update everyone because we did our homework oh, based after on, the episode instead of before, and we found out the name of that documentary. Yes, yeah, we speaking about. of things I can't remember, like where I'm at in the show, the, the things I couldn't remember from the last buzz. So the, the name of the documentary that I was talking about was called In Search of Balance uh, with Dr. Daphne Miller um, – that one really connected with me with my inner Libra. Which I'm all about balance. So that one really struck a chord with me. Um, I really like that. So if you get a chance, watch that. And I, we, we did reach out to Dr. Daphne Miller to try to get her to be a guest on the, the podcast. Mm. I haven't really heard back, but I'm not going to, to give up on that one. So I'd love to do that. So anyway, back on topic. Um, judging by your listeners' reactions, when we posted something in the Facebook group, Tom uh, – put a post up a couple days ago um the reactions for this 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 is a very hot topic and we got a lot of questions from our listeners as well and we have a lot of questions this isn't one of my strengths at all so yeah, mine, mine really either <clears throat> i we we typically talk about native plants and we make some mention of invasive plants but not a lot but uh you talk to a lot of our our customers from pylons nursery a lot of people just in the restoration industry they say, well, you're not going to have good project success unless you control the invasive plants. Yeah. So that's a big, big part of getting the natives established is getting rid of the invasive plants that are already there. Exactly. And we always focus on the natives but not the nemesis of natives or, or the opposite end. And I didn't realize until our listeners started asking questions that I didn't know the answers yeah. to yeah. a lot of the questions they were asking. So um, it made me feel good that, that we chose – the guests that we have on mm -hmm. today so yeah so mike with that i'll let you uh kind of introduce yourself tell tell our listeners a little bit about what you do and how you got into working um i don't want to say with invasive plants removing invasive plants i guess okay yeah i have um wear a few different hats uh depending on the day but um i do i'm the stewardship director for friends of hopewell valley open space and i've been there for i think 14 years or so i didn't realize and, it was that long wow yeah time does fly yes. um and uh you know and then we started the strike team uh about 12 years ago and you know i guess i've always been involved with invasives one way or the other like you said through as an undergraduate doing restorations, uh, you know, uh, with Rutgers, you know, that's where I sort of, I was introduced to invasive species and, you know, realized what a threat they are and, um, you know, how they can damage communities. 
We, I, you know, in doing research for today, and I hadn't realized it. I uh, saw that the National Wildlife Refuge uh, Refuge System identified in 2004 over two and a half million acres of their land was infested with invasives, and they actually started off by creating five uh, invasive species strike teams throughout the U.S. Yep. Uh, not in our area, but in other parts of of the U.S. And I wasn't sure if this kind of was an extension of that. Um, that program. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess I mean for sure. Um, you know, it's not a coincidence that the name is the same. Um, when I was doing writing up the state plan for invasive species, I was doing lots of research, and you know, I found their program and and thought how great it was. Um, you know, and I thought you know this this is something that needs to come to New Jersey, which which is perfect timing. So I I thought you know one of the things that Tom kind of pointed out that when we're writing questions, I tend to skip ahead to where I'm comfortable starting <laughs> and maybe not where our listener needs to start. So we wanted to take it a few steps backwards mm-hmm. and just start okay. with with maybe what your definition of an invasive plant is. Like I know what mine is, but I don't know that our, and our really, listeners – Yeah, some listeners that are very new to this, they don't even know invasive plants are a thing. They understand – they've probably heard the – the I want, I'm going to say buzzword, but it's not really a buzzword. But they've heard of a native plants, and it's kind of new and fancy yeah. to them. But they don't necessarily know about invasive plants. So, what is an invasive plant? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's definitely formal definitions of it. I mean, my sort of informal definition is they're not non-native plants. They form dense colonies and they persist over time. Okay. You know, and, and, and they cause by in doing that they cause ecological damage and could also cause, you know, issues for, for people as well. Um, but yeah, I think it's, you know, pretty straightforward. I mean, I think separating, you know, you could be a native weed, but that doesn't make you invasive. The formal definition says non native. Um, mm. you know, you could be non native and certainly not invasive, even when abundant in uh at least temporarily like um, a yellow rocket or a queen anne's lace mm-hmm. okay you know you, you could have a whole field filled with them i don't refer to them as invasive because they go away on their own yeah. you know over over succession they go away so you know it's it's really kind of getting at those non-native species that can form dense colonies um or have other obvious detrimental impacts because it's not only plants it's all kinds of things um and they persist over time you know, and it's funny, even breaking that down, one of the things I struggle with sometimes, even just wording it properly, because I feel that if it's a native, it can't be invasive. But there are natives, if you put them in areas that they're not necessarily native to, they can be aggressive, like maybe mm-hmm. cattails. Like even though it's native, it can be on the aggressive side, but I wouldn't call it invasive. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, and a, a lot of that goes to sort of imbalances you know um although a whole field of goldenrod is beautiful and it's native and then you know there should be no cause of concern you know but you know their 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 aggressiveness um is sort of linked to disturbed soils Mm -hmm. from usually post-agricultural soils are very disturbed and support weeds of all types and um and deer pressure you know mm-hmm. that that yeah. eliminates other uh, other species that might compete if they weren't so delicious. <laughs> um, you know, so you know it, it, it can be it, native species can act in you know quote invasive ways, and there's usually a reason for it. Yeah, uh, could, related to humans. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, because we've we've mentioned on numerous uh, previous episodes of the podcast, like Marcus Gray had brought up that. Uh, common uh, milkweed they don't necessarily like in Georgia because it tends to be aggressive and outcompetes. Or mm-hmm. we know that even though Spartina alterniflora is native up and down the the east coast and and the, the southeast, if you moved it over to the west coast, it outcompetes their native baygrass because it's not native there. Um, yeah. So it's is you know there there is striking a balance there. But we're I guess we're focusing on the exotics, the, right. the, the things that aren't aren't native to north america i would right. i would guess that's so if you were to break it down just for for the the new listener why are invasive plants such a problem what's the all right there's there's things here they persist over time why is this an issue i think the biggest the biggest um 
the biggest reason is they break the food web, you know, and it, just to put it in a somewhat different light, um, you know, the reason why you don't want dense monocultures, or let me take it a step, one step further back. The reason why certain non-native plants are invasive is because they've escaped their natural predators. Okay. You know, so you bring a plant over from Europe, from Asia, and it doesn't have its specialized insects that eat it there and keep it in check, then it's free to grow without that negative, you know, that weight on it of its of its predator. It could be a pathogen, an insect, whatever. Um, you know, and in our case, deer. You know, you're not going to. There's not uh, too many non-native plants that deer like that become invasive. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's a sort of similar kind of a thing that um, it's a, a huge selection factor. It's a huge screen deer overpopulation. Um, so yeah, I mean that's and that and that the reason why you know for the most part if you move native species within the country, it's connected. It's a continent mm-hmm. and its pests could follow it. You know. So, you know, there, there's less likelihood of a mis, a, uh, moving a native plant and having it become a problem as opposed to moving something across continents and it doesn't come with, it, with its pests. So, you know, that, that's a lot of the, the rationale behind it. I, I, I kind of look at it like I, – I know this is a strange analogy like Superman. <clears throat> like he's normal. <laughs> he's normal on Krypton, but then you bring him to another world and all of a sudden he's unstoppable. You know, right, he has right. he doesn't have any of his natural Frame, enemies. When you brought up Superman, I did not know where you're going. But that actually that's a <laughs> yeah. pretty good way to put it. That's yeah, like <laughs> he has no natural enemies on Earth. He's stronger than everyone else. No one can out compete him and he can just take over. If he wanted to, he could take over. He just happens right. to be a nice invasive and chooses not to <laughs> <laughs> choose to help us. But that's right. that's but the if way. you wanted to biologically control him, you'd bring the kryptonite from his home yeah. planet, you know, and there you go. Exactly. So I, I figured that was a fair way to uh, – a yeah. fair analogy. And, so, But, you know – I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go yeah, ahead. and the, the reason I just wanted to um, answer the question more fully, your initial question was, you know, so why are they a problem? You know, because – so if you don't have insects eating your leaves, you don't have birds that could eat those insects, for example. You know, so we we know, you know, over the last 50 years, coincidentally, when invasives really started to bloom, um, that we have, you know, a third less birds than we used to 50 years ago. We've had crashes in insect populations, you know, so, you know, there's a there's a reason why think they're bad. You know, it isn't just like, oh, they have thorns or, oh, they take over and they don't let other native plants grow. There's a strong, strong impact of that. Yeah. It isn't just visually for us. The food web is broken. You know, if you have um, an area that's taken over by one plant and bugs don't eat it, um, when in that same amount of space you might have had 50 different native plants with a whole assemblage of bugs um, and a whole food web associated with it, that food web is gone in that spot. Yeah. You add that up over hundreds of thousands of acres. Now you have less birds. Now you have less bugs. You know, so that, that's really the, the fundamental reason why it's a problem. You know, it's funny because to the average person, this past summer, and I'm trying to remember the name of the place. My fiance and I took a, a hike through Croft Farm, I believe it is, in like the Haddonfield area, in New Jersey, and and she was <clears throat> remarking that she thought it was beautiful. But me being the the native plant person, looking through. It was all invasives. Like other than the, the tall trees, which weren't all native, it was it was all invasive. There was no native understory. Then you noticed that there wasn't a lot of bird activity. Uh, y- you know, it was actually kind of quiet <laughs> in there. Mm-hmm. Um, it wasn't dense. It was actually, you know, what Tom was saying when a, a healthy forest, you should be able to throw a tennis ball ten feet, and not see it. Yeah, you know, right. I I could have seen right. it for for. 30 yards 40 yards you know so right. it was it, it's an ecosystem that's kind of broken it's not functioning though it might look okay but it's not functioning the way it should function yeah for sure and, it, and there's so much you know we know a, some information obviously ecological information but what we don't know is about 100 times more than what we know at least <laughs> if not a thousand yeah you know so we, we you know we, we could i could say the things i said oh the food web is broken it's diminished you know, I don't know the half of it, mm-hmm. you know, so, you know, I, I think sort of that, um, you know, 
and it can go into other type topics and arguments was like why use native plants in your landscape versus non-native plants even if they're not invasive because you want to contribute back to the food web you know and and you when you plant native plants it comes with it without you knowing all of the details Mm -hmm. You know, so yeah, and you know, one of the the things we wanted to discuss with you, just for a lot of the people that are just starting out with this, a lot of these people are like, well, these plants have been here for such a long time. Why is this an issue? Or yeah. why would they be here if they were a problem? Well, where did these plants come from? Mm-hmm. You know, right. and and that's a multitude of different things. And I didn't know if we could discuss that for a little bit. Even you know, even some of the plants we're going to discuss later on, you can go into garden centers and find these plants yeah. because people still buy them because they're uneducated as to why they're an issue right Um, yeah so i thought we could just at least start off like how did these plants get here or why they're here yeah so i mean there's purposeful introductions like landscape plants um you know they're they're pretty in some way or they make fruit or they're great for screening or whatever they have you know values uh, and cultural values in our landscape and you know a lot of our many many of our invasive species were purposely introduced through the landscape trade um you know going back into victorian days where it was you know almost a sign of your sophistication and wealth if you had a bunch of plants from china and europe in your garden yeah you know so it, it, it it demonstrated some level of economic power and sophistication and a lot of plants were introduced for those reasons um you know and then if they became popular and they were propagated you know now you're now you're getting into the sort of math of population growth if you introduce enough of these individuals of a population then they can self-sustain um but then there's also accidental um you know stiltgrass is a good case study with that it was so when they were shipping um you know china porcelain china back in the day um they didn't have styrofoam peanuts or air-filled plastic pockets mm-hmm. um they use still grass as the packing material wow so it became over accidentally and there's, there's plenty of accidentals as well but um you know it is a mix it's purposeful introductions and accidental um and i think that the the thing that worries me most i mean i i have ultimately i have complete faith in nature um it is tougher than we could ever imagine more resilient than we could ever imagine Um, But the rate of change is the problem. Mm -hmm. You know, when we think, oh, these plants have been here forever, that's not really true. And it does depend on your time frame. But, you know, the alarm bells didn't start going off until the 1950s that invasives might be a problem. Mm -hmm. Um, I read, I did a report for a watch on reservation last year, and I read an old botanical study from the 50s. And basically it was like, yeah, yeah, invasives really aren't a problem here. I mean, he mentioned Japanese honeysuckle, which is probably our oldest invasive. Um, He mentioned a couple of tree of heaven and the uh, county park at the time just planted a hedgerow of multiflora rose because they were the government, the federal government was giving them out for free. (laughs) You know, that's the only mention of invasive species in the 1950s at Watchung Reservation. Wow. You know, so we think, oh, well, 1950, that's a long time ago. But not nature's point of view. That's barely a blink of an eye. That's like a one one hundredth of a blink of an eye. And we've changed the landscape, added tons of thousands, hundreds of thousands of acres of invasive species cover. And everything has to adapt to it like that. Um, Yeah. And that's a one thing. Um. That another reason why some of these invasives got brought over was actually for, um, I guess our governments would actually bring them over for different uses, like a kudzu in yeah. down south that was brought over right. to help control erosion. It didn't yep. necessarily have, I guess, ornamental value, or, but it was really good at holding down um, down slopes along roads. And well, now we see what happened with it. And, and I, like crown vetch, I think is another one that kind of falls in that category that yeah. fell out of favor pretty quick and i i think a lot of these misconceptions are just a imperfect understanding of what an invasive is because mm-hmm. if i go back to the mid 90s to when i worked at the connor Powell company and you looked at what we sold we sold a ton of uh loose strife burning bush barberry uh japanese bloodgrass um 
Japanese silver grass, like all these things that are invasive mm. were our best sellers because yeah. it something doesn't come over here and just explode overnight and become an invasive. It takes time. Mm-hmm. It may, you know, it takes wildlife adapting to it. It may take 10, 15, 20 years, and then all of a sudden something realizes it's a food source and it explodes before it's an issue. And it's because they went so long without being an issue, nurseries, you know, this was probably 10 of our top sellers at yeah. that point. What nursery is going to want to give that up? Give yeah. that up, yeah. They they still promote its growth. So it's it's a misunderstanding on both sides of the industry, mm-hmm. you know, in the industry and the and the homeowner itself. Well, it, and, and and there's a reason why you know you want your customers to have success growing the plant, right? So yeah. you want the plant to have certain characteristics, and and no one wants the blemishes of two marks from bugs on your plants. So <laughs> exactly. And then you want it to be someone who has a black thumb could even have it grow because it's so hardy and so adaptable to different conditions. So it it's almost like you're selecting the non-native plants that are invasives because they have good qualities for, you know, propagating and selling them and having them stay alive as someone's house. You know, you, you hear a lot of these plants as being touted as pest resistant when in a functioning ecosystem, insects are eating. <laughs> yeah, they may not be. It's just here yeah. there isn't the insect to eat them. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So you're planting them because people are planting them because they want them to look nice. But you really want that interaction if the ecosystem's healthy and they're they're not decimating a plant. They're just they're they're sampling everything. Yeah. Like you shouldn't yeah. have a mass, you know, like Japanese beetles will eat roses because these roses aren't native here either. The Japanese beetles, they finally found a native food source mm-hmm. for themselves and they'll decimate it. That's an ecosystem out of whack. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And right, I, I don't right. think people realize that when they're 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 looking at it that way. Yeah. So, so and we, I think, yeah. Oh, you I go, mean, Mike. The, the, yeah, okay, sorry. No, no, no. Yeah, I'm, I'm asking a new question, so you, you go. I think you know one of the, the, the other thing that, it, uh, you know, if anyone that knows me knows, I say it a million times. But you know, if you look at the the curve of growth of uh, invasive species, it goes right along with the population of deer. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, starting around 19, around 1970, we had the historic amount of deer in New Jersey, about 10 deer per square mile. There's many places that have well over 100 deer per square mile now. Yeah. You know, so that it's a, and, that, and they, the deer population exponentially grew from 72 towards to now. And coincidentally, invasive species also picked up. <laughs> their massive amount of coverage at the same time yeah. invasive species that deer tend not to eat it's, it's not a coincidence obviously mm-hmm. yeah. yeah yeah i i, I agree i i agree 100 percent. and it's you know a lot of the things you know i talked about it on one of the the previous podcasts but i just noticed in in one of the facebook groups not ours but someone asking for taxis canadensis mm-hmm. and i was like we were just talking about that you know yeah. deer yeah. It was around in the early 70s because the deer population was in check. Once they were out of yeah. check, they ate them all because <laughs> they they enjoy that plant. Yeah. But it was too many deer for not enough plants, and that was a host of inchworms. Now you don't see as many inchworms. Like the yeah. whole thing uh, spiraled, yep. you know, out of control from that. So I think – I'm sorry. Yeah, I was, I was going to say we've generally talked about invasive plants and how they got here, but what are some of these, these – big players that you're you're fighting with on a, a week to week or month to month basis that you're seeing popping up all over in on our area of New Jersey. Yeah, yeah. I mean there's certainly you know, there's the widespread things like Japanese barberry, Asiatic bittersweet, autumn olive, et cetera, et cetera. Um and then there's sort of like um the emerging group. Um you know, so I, I really worry about a host <clears throat> of plants that are shade tolerant they can grow often clonally and by spread by seeds um and they're tall you know so in my my fantasy world when the deer population has been brought under control they'll be competitive anyway because they're as big as our typical central and north jersey shrub layer like spice bush and black haw and things mm-hmm. like that so i worry about them a lot Barberry, yeah, sure, it's a huge problem. If the deer population was lower, you would see spice bush popping through it and shading it out over time. Mm-hmm. That's not going to happen with these species like Siebel's viburnum, Linden viburnum. Yeah. 
uh, buckthorn, oriental photinia, Japanese aurelia. You know, these are things that even if the deer population were lower, they're still going to have some competitive ability versus many of our other uh, well-established invasive species. You know, and it's I think it's fair to to state that there's many – the the reasons why invasives aren't just one thing it's not just deer it could be disturbance you know as we change things we we do more construction or or things like that and and we do ground disturbance that opens the area like we do know that invasives if if you disturb the soil they they're more apt to take over mm-hmm. um uh you know one is is phragmites i think is a great mm-hmm. Uh, as you get soil erosion or if, if conditions change and it goes from fresh water to salty like uh, or brackish and kills some things mm-hmm. off, it just opens the door for for other species, invasive species, to, to, to take over. Yeah. I, I think that's yeah. fair to say too. Um, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, absolutely. I mean the whole Meadowlands complex went from some glorious wetland complex to Phragmites, um, and that was a salinity thing and disturbance and such. I mean on uplands, it's very clear um, what happens with a post-agricultural soil that was tilled for who knows how long. When it's abandoned, it becomes a hotbed of weeds and areas that were never plowed which also tended to be areas that had sandier soil or rockier soil or thinner soil, which also isn't favorable to weeds. But when you disturb a soil, you affect it probably for a millennia or more. And Mm. everything about it has changed biologically, chemically, physically. It's just a completely different animal than a natural, healthy forest soil that hasn't been altered. And, you know, that the weight of invasive species, you can go to any site um, and compare post-agricultural forest to never agricultural forest and see a huge difference in the abundance of invasive species, yeah. you know, present, present day. Yeah. And that's, that's noticeable. <laughs> you know, I've, I've been doing more and more and more hiking and that's the one thing I look for, just like some of these old growth forests. Like if you go to Sadler woods mm-hmm. and it's something, you know, it's been impacted around it, but those woods haven't been touched for hundreds of years there's a difference (laughs) in in those woods and some of these other woods that maybe bordered uh farmland or were farmland at at, at some point and it's it's it is a night and day difference which is a shame um so we have we have invasives we have them becoming a problem a bigger issue not only are they out there and they need to be controlled they're still being sold and brought over so what inspired along comes the in space uh, invasive species spike spike uh, strike team what inspired that for friends of hopewell valley open space and what inspired you to be a part of that yeah i mean i think a lot of the motivation was the ability to completely waste all of your time on invasive species <laughs> without making any progress <laughs> you know and and it was like you know this this isn't working for me you know like you know i kept i and i still constantly say these two words in my head effective efficient effective efficient Mm -hmm. you know and and because you could lose yourself in a a sea of barberry and not make a darn bit of difference um you know so that the strike team was really about focusing on newly emerging invasive species Mm -hmm. you know it's it's always been our biggest focus i mean we will we'll take out anything yeah you're wrong here but um (laughs) but (laughs) But, you know, we, when any site we go to, there's a stewardship hierarchy. Okay. So, you know, first thing is reduce the deer population. Okay. Allow that competitive interaction to occur again um, or make it more likely. And then you look for the newly emerging things, in which often aren't many. Get rid of those. Then you go to your areas that are relatively clean of invasives. Keep them clean. Then finally, you go to that area that's heavily impacted if you have funding for restoration. Okay. Um, You know, and I think just basically trying to have the biggest impact possible is what spurred the strike team into existence. Um, And it started, like I said, about 12 years ago. So we, um, for a very brief instant, it was called the Hopewell Valley Invasive Species Strike Team. Okay. 
Um, and then we formed a partnership with um, what's now Raritan Headwaters Association, and we, we started the Central Jersey Invasive Strike Team. Um, and that was a great partnership, and it, it brought lots of people involved, including folks that could help raise funds and get grants and things like that. Mm-hmm. So it really started to pick up steam. And then it did transition to become the New Jersey Strike Team as its own separate nonprofit. Um, but that was very hard to maintain, and despite incredible efforts by you know Melissa Almendinger and Susan Brookman, uh, John Wager, and others, you know, to keep it uh, going, it, it, it is hard to keep a, a small independent nonprofit going. Yeah, yeah. and, those, um, and so. those are some great names you mentioned there too. Uh, working on it, it's it's difficult, but you're actually still covering a pretty large geographic area. If, yeah, we're if, still statewide. We're statewide. Okay. That that hasn't changed. We're 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 working at a Friends of Hopewell Valley, um, which has been an incredible thing actually for the strike team. Yeah. Um, and uh, but we do have the, the strike team does have the uh, statewide uh, mission, mm-hmm. and it just you know it's it's a much more efficient way, you know, uh, you know we don't have to you know. Um, we could receive grants and, and everything else. And we have all this support from the organization that keeps us going. So if we have a contract with someone, we could actually pay people before we get paid at the end for our contract. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, when we were at our own independent thing, it was like, how would you even do that? You know, like, mm-hmm. you know, people need to get paid when they work, not three or four months later, yeah. you know, so having an organization and being part of it, a supportive organization, has has really uh, shored up the strike team, which is which is great. I I have to admit, I'm and I'm embarrassed by this. That my first learning of the strike team came from someone out of state. So it was uh, Joan Hansen, who mm, yeah. um, is was one of our employees in in upstate New York, sent me an email from the strike team saying, "Hey, you may want to check this out." And I was like, "This is right in our backyard." I didn't even really know about this and then i was really embarrassed and then i was really fascinated (laughs) um about the work that was being done and the email she had sent was some innovative approaches you were using to to work with tree of heaven in response to spotted lanternfly so i wanted to talk about some of the approaches I, i think that's really unique you're not just going out and ripping out plants there's there's some very innovative things going on to to combat some of these issues. And I was hoping we could talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, I think a lot of things, the, the, the strike team and being sort of this entity that is a repository of information, mm-hmm. you know, people reach out to us and they, or, or, or are we just talking with our colleagues, you know, and then we could adapt, take those ideas, not make them our own, but use them and then also reamplify them back out to the entire conservation community. Okay. So I learned of uh, a device called the EasyJect um, from a colleague who was using it and said, wow, that, that's really fascinating. This is this really neat device and it's, um, you know, has a lot of uh, benefits logistically. Um, it's basically a, a lance with you know, quote unquote bullets that okay. have herbicide in them. Okay. And then when you push the lance into the bark of the tree, the bullet sticks in there and releases herbicide just in the plant that mm-hmm. you're trying to get. Okay. Um, so no muss, no fuss. Um, so we actually, prior to, well, the lantern flies, we had a rare species habitat that was filled with rare animals and rare plants. And there was large patches of Alanthus. Um, and, we didn't want to broadcast herbicides. There was too many things that you didn't want to hit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so we mapped all of the, the tree of heaven, came back with our easy jacked, um, you know, over time, different people, we mapped it out so different people over time could return nowhere it was. Okay. Um, and you know, you, we put easy jacked into it, into the main stems and these were a clonal bunch. So okay. you had <clears throat> many hundreds if not into the thousands of larger individuals with, you know, pencil thin shoots everywhere, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. Gotcha. So th- this worked very systemically. So we treated all the large stems, the large and the small stems died. And, mm-hmm. you know, we were very happy with the effect and we did get a conservation, which n- almost never happens. We got a conservation result within a year or two. 
Wow. Wow. Um, some of the rare animals responded to the extra light, the plants as well. So, you know, it, it, it's one of those very good success stories. And it all started with a colleague telling me about this new cool thing, you know. So now when we recommend it, you know, to everyone that we talk to. So, again, it's taking one person's piece of information and knowledge. They tell us we amplify it. And I think to me that's the value of the strike team. And that's incredible because that's a plant that's pretty much ecologically barren mm -hmm. uh, as far as interaction with native insects. Um, so you're not really disturbing any population there by getting rid of it. You're, it, you know, the sunlight allowing the what's in the seed bank to come up. The animal interaction is is wonderful without disturbing anything else. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And and, and you know, coincidentally, you know, with the lantern flies. And, and it kind of harkens back to the conversations we started with, but lanternflies introduced to U.S. and require Tree of Heaven as one of their food sources. So they were one of the specialized mm -hmm. predators on Atlantis in its home range. So yeah. we'll see if it actually controls it here or not, because I'm sure there was other things that ate Atlantis, too, that didn't come over. Yeah. Um, but for people who want to reduce lanternfly damage, you know, using the easy eject on, on Atlantis is a, is a good, fast way to do it. Mm -hmm. In the, in the Hopewell Valley, is is lantern fly already an issue for you? Like for us, where we're at in Burlington County, we've seen a handful, but it hasn't seemed to be an issue yet. Yeah, yeah, it might be more specialized. I mean, they. I, I'm not an expert on lantern flies by any stretch, but in Central and North Jersey, just about every tree of heaven you find has the honeydew followed by the black city mm -hmm. mold underneath it. Yeah. Um, and I know they also like to eat grapes and things in the grape mm -hmm. family. Yeah. Um, so it might, I don't know about Burlington, but if there's not enough of preferred hosts, it might not take off as well. Gotcha. Yeah. With, with that project that you just described, what, if you were to just leave it be, would it return to how it was when you found it? Or is it something like, I guess what I'm asking, is it going to require continual human maintenance to to keep it at its um at its current state yeah i think that's always a question and, and you know we put in that much effort in that place for a very specific reason it was loaded with rare plants and okay. rare rare species so you know you you, t you take it back you take it out of this equation and yeah it's possible and likely that you'll get new um, seeds will land and start to grow and then we stay on top of them. Um, but, you know, we, we've undone, you know, in one or two, you know, I guess it was a summer or so, we undid, you know, 50 years of infestation of that species. Yeah. So, you know, sure, we have to keep up with it in that place, but um, there's plenty of other invasives there, but that was the one that was really uh, strategically important to remove. Well, and, and, and part of the reason, for, everything's like fly paper, right? So yeah. the reason why we were particularly concerned is because there was a lot of ash trees in this habitat too, yeah. which were, we knew were going to succumb to emerald ash borer. Mm -hmm. So we said, if we don't get rid of this Atlantis and the ash comes down, it's going to all be Atlantis. Mm -hmm. That's a great you know? point. I didn't even think about so, that. Yeah, I mean, that's the beauty. That's why I love ecology. It's, it's, um, <laughs> everything's so connected and, oh, and yeah. complicated and fun. <laughs> so how – that's that's one part of your mission. How important is outreach and education uh, to the invasive species strike team? Yeah, it, it, absolutely. I mean because of you know that point of – you know, do I really want to be fishing new plants out of the woods forever? Um, you know, I think – getting the outreach out there and you know there's always this combination the fun combination of you know ignorance and apathy right yeah um yeah. i don't know and i don't care right <laughs> um but you know it's breaking through that you know it's it's sort of um with the ultimate goal of people getting behind it either not buying invasive plants i always said the easiest thing to do is to not do something right yeah. don't buy invasive plants um and then you know forming a local strike team and taking care of one of your local parks, you know, and, and onward, you know, from there, um, doing deer management on your property, if you have a large enough property for it. Yeah. So we want to, we, we, you, we have this problem and it's getting bigger and bigger because not enough people know or care about it. 
Yeah. You know, so it's really important to, to do outreach to get more people to know and care about it. Mm-hmm. One one of the things I love about the area of Hopewell Valley is how closely you work with all the other organizations, like it, more so than any part of the state to me. You know, you have the Sourlands Conservancy, you have DNR Greenway, you have uh, Raritan Valley. Like all of you work together very well and are very interconnected, and I'm sure that has to help that education and public awareness as well. It's it, it's not too often you see that many groups working in harmony that well together. Yeah, I think – I mean I think um... – yeah, and in Mercer County as well. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, but it, it's, you know, I think everyone realizes the fight is bigger than any of us, you know, and it's sort of like that, you know, um, it, it sounds like a weird thing to say. It almost like it's the scope of the problem and it, it just almost enforces like a unit cohesion, yeah. <laughs> you know. Yeah. It's like we all know we're in this together. Let's help each other out when we can. And, and everyone that's involved has that attitude and it, it's it makes makes um you know our efforts enjoyable um you know that you we could all be kind of pulling together um so yeah there's lots of cross cross um pollination going on among all the groups and and beyond yeah speaking of raising awareness too how how big has technology become like your website has a bevy of fantastic information um but you also have a smartphone app um that that actually one of our listeners brought up in the facebook group last night um about for invasive species how has that helped with your public awareness and what are some of those tools in technology that you're using yeah i think the app is the biggest thing and that was um you know we got an nrcs i think uh innovation uh kind of uh, cost share um i don't know i can't remember exactly six or seven years ago i'd have to look up the exact date but we we had people you know we on our website we would post a um a spreadsheet here okay. enter your data in here and then send it back to us and we'll you know handwritten and then we'll enter it you know and that was maddening um <laughs> <laughs> so, i can imagine um, yeah, so when we had the opportunity and we got this uh, award, we worked with the University of Georgia and uh, EdMaps. Um, you know, so they had a system um, regionally for the Mid Atlantic, and then they had some state apps and things like that. And you know, working with them, we made a state app for New Jersey, okay. and that's our strike team app. And and the good thing about it is that it somehow has more species than the than the um the regional map uh mm-hmm. regional app wow. um and it's more specific to new jersey okay so you know you can go on this app and it's categorized uh by type of, you know birds and mammals and shrubs and trees and you know it's you can kind of look at that and and um every species that's on our list that we update annually has a fact sheet and some pictures associated with it. So you could use it as a field guide to some extent. I mean, oh, it doesn't have the AI that, you know, um, uh, thoughts escape, iNaturalist has. Oh, yeah. Um, but, you know, you could use the two in concert as well. You could use iNaturalist to get yourself in the ballpark or maybe know exactly what it is. Yeah. And then you could look at our app and say, is that thing I, that iNaturalist is telling me, is, does the strike team concerned about that? <laughs> <laughs> Um, and then once you identify, you know, it's basically crowdsourced information. The, 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 our, our app allows you to submit to our, a database that that's maintained and over time. And, that, and to me, that is a hugely powerful tool for conservation. You know, again, you, you have hundreds of people with their own observations, not necessarily sharing them. And that is a mechanism to report to a central th- a database and anyone at any time could look at it and it accumulates over time and it helps us learn about the rate of spread and, and distribution of invasives. So it's, it's been really helpful for us. And I think, you know, for people learning about invasives, it's helpful for them. I, I was actually going to wait till the end to do all of the listener questions. When when Tom put, posted this in the Facebook group, we, we got a slew of questions. But this one's kind of on topic, and I, I thought I'd bring this one up. Um, one of our listeners, uh, Deborah Rosenthal, she's in Tennessee, and I guess she was a little frustrated just for uh, inconsistency between 
all different ways to find out if something is invasive. She she was bringing up uh, persicaria, which she said wasn't officially recognized on Tennessee's invasive list, but some things were saying that it was invasive. Some literature was saying to plant it, <laughs> and it was just – she was like, I don't really know where where to go or what's right. Like, so uh, what, what are the best avenues for someone that's a novice that's trying to figure this out? Like, what, what should they stick to when, when trying to figure out if something is in fact an invasive? Yeah. And I, and I think that's what we try to do for New Jersey, understanding everything that, that that person brought up, you know, we wanted to have something that had, um, you know, a solid list for New Jersey. Okay. And the reason the reason the list is solid is because we have a technical advisory committee, you know, with like 10 people on it that know all kinds of things about all kinds of things. Yeah. You yeah. know, so every year we meet and we review our list and we say, okay, should these things be in the same categories or have they spread more? Is there something new to consider? And let's talk about whether that should be added to our list or not. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we, all of that information floating out in the world, you know, we try to accumulate for New Jersey and make the decisions for New Jersey. And every year we put out the formal complete list of, of every invasive species in New Jersey. Awesome. Um, awesome. So it yeah. sounds like, I don't know if Tennessee has that. Maybe that's something that they yeah. want to try to spearhead to, <clears throat> to have them look at that possibly more serious if, uh, or, or just get more succinct uh, with it. If, if that becomes an issue, because I know, different areas are going to have different ideas of what's an, a, mm-hmm. a, a pending issue for them. Yeah. And for, for those of you who want to download this app right now, we're, we're going to mention it again at the the end, but yeah. it's also, uh, I think I just looked up New Jersey Invasives and it came up on my iPhone. Oh, awesome. So, um, so you can look that up and it actually says on your website, download the New Jersey Invasives application. So if you search that on iPhone or Android or, or whatever smartphone you have, you'll be able to find that app and, and see what we were just talking about. Awesome. Awesome. So, Mike, what are some of the ongoing or existing projects that you're working on right now um, besides, say, the Tree of Heaven we discussed? Are there are there anything ongoing anywhere in the state that's significant that you'd want to discuss? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we have um, probably our, our, we have a large grant with the U.S. Forest Service that we just finished our second year and we'll be finishing up in 2021. And that, that's been, you know, a great project. There's almost sort of what you were referring to before we have lots of different partners involved yeah um you know so we have monmouth county parks mercer county parks um new jersey conservation foundation new jersey audubon um you know and in addition to that we have and in keeping with lots of the different things that i've been saying earlier is we have lots of different private landowners involved so we have 50 private landowners um and that's as important. well as yeah yeah that's and huge. it's the same kind of thing right it's the same we have the similar message when we go out you know we go to a private land we're looking for the newly emerging bases and we want to get rid of them we say are you doing hunting here are they taking enough deer um mm-hmm. you know and then we make maps and plans and say okay if you were going to do this over the next 10 years what would you do as priority one two three four five you know, so it's, again, trying to make things effective and efficient and sort of bringing that information that we've pooled from the entire conservation community. I don't consider it strike teams information. I think it's information we've pooled from everywhere. We put those that information it guides how we make these plans. Yeah. Um, so I, I think that's, you know, it's been a very good project um, because of the amount of sort of combined outreach and stewardship that's that's part of it. One of the organizations we didn't mention earlier, we were talking to Dr. Emil DeVito last week, and I guess uh, New Jersey Conservation Foundation recent, recently purchased 110 acres in Hopewell Valley, which which is great to hear because then you feel that's area that will get proper stewardship and, and help towards the fight. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, and, I, and I think, that, you know, uh, we – Obviously, buying land and having it under the control of a sympathetic group is is great. Yeah. Um, and I think we also have to be as diligent in acquisition as we are in outreach with folks to try to encourage stewardship on their properties. You know, in Hopewell, I mean, I think one of the 
things I like doing with Friends of Hopewell Valley is our community conservation program. Okay. You know, so in that we have about 200, you know, residents of Hopewell Valley involved covering about 3,500 acres. And, you know, we're able to have a sustained uh, conversation and communication with them, learn from them. Um, and, you know, and we're trying to make the entire Hopewell Valley as good as it could be, you know. Yeah. And so we, we not only sort of focus on removing the negatives, right, invasives, we also focus on planting natives. Mm, yeah. So we've had the program going on for about six or seven years. And, you know, folks have bought 42,000 native plants through wow. us. Wow. You know, that's impressive. Uh, yeah. And it, it's, you know, people are interested and hungry for, for, for native plants, but it's, it is hard for a lot of people um, to get them. It's not as easy as going to, um, you know, to Home Depot or whatever and, you know, picking up a flat of annuals. No, uh, you know, and it's, that's the the biggest complaint we hear from our listeners are where yeah. to find those native plants and and we're hoping with this that that other nurseries see the opportunity and that changes we we want everyone to be able to get native plants you know and you mentioned home depot if you go into a box store i don't know if most people realize this if when you look at the signs of the plant that you're looking at it will tell you the nursery that it came from and from where so i went into uh, the local Home Depot store uh, by me in Burlington, New Jersey, and most of the material is from Oregon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, yeah. you mm -hmm. know, just looking at it, you know, and that's not what you want. If Even if they were native plants, that's not what you want. You don't want that plant coming from Oregon. Mm -hmm. We've discussed that uh, many times. So I, you brought up actually a great point, and you're talking about not only removing the negative but focus, focusing on the positive. What are some of the success stories that you've encountered uh, while doing this? Yeah, I think, you know, it, it's particular situations lend themselves to, you know, relatively quick success, right? I mean, one of the, and again, it's another, I'm trumpeting the, how the, how the strike team works as a network of people, but, um, someone told me about this new weed that showed up at, um, at White Lake in Warren County. Okay. And I had never heard of it before. And they said, yeah, it's a pretty big patch. I looked it up. I said, oh, look, it's a huge problem in rangeland. Um, <laughs> it's never been heard of in New Jersey before. No one else oh. has ever seen it. It randomly shows up. And because I happen to live very close to White Lake, I'm like, oh, I'm going to make a Sunday afternoon trip. And I'm okay. going to treat them and get rid of them. You know, so, you know, that is truly early detection rapid response. Wow. And, and I didn't know it was there. Someone figured it out and then said, I should tell the strike team. And in this case, I was like, I should go kill it. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Before um, any of our listeners get too many ideas, I will say that you have permission to go there and do this. Oh, yeah, yeah, it yeah, wasn't, yeah. It wasn't a, it was, it wasn't oh, a yeah, night. it went down it to my park. Rogue. Was, yeah. Mike didn't go rogue. <laughs> yeah, you yeah. know. <laughs> um, my infrared camera, you know, my black outfit at midnight. Yeah. Like that, that did not happen. So one thing, you know, one thing that our our listeners' questions for you really opened our eyes because there was things that we hadn't thought of. And, and Tom brought this up. One of our listeners, uh, Bill Stusnick, which, who I believe is in New Jersey, mm -hmm. uh, was asking about if there was a the, – what the best way to get rid of lesser celandine was other than digging it up and all the rhizomes. And, and yeah. Tom and I were like, I'm not even from, really that familiar with, with that plant. Were you, were I'd, you? I'd seen it. I didn't really pay much attention to it. It was just a weed that I had so, popping up around my garden in my yard. But yeah, so I want to yeah. address that if you know of a of the best practice for that. But also, what are some of the lesser known? Like we we we've talked about some of the well known uh, issues. What are some of the lesser known invasives I'd, that people? And I'd to? say lesser known, and then also some of those ones that might be popping up just around your house that you might not not know about or in your garden where you are disturbing the soil when you plant new things yeah right right i mean part of the um beauty said sarcastically of the stray team is people do tell us everything that they say <laughs> um so i you know i get a, a barrage of you know bad news or potentially bad news on a regular basis yeah um but that's exactly what we want we want to know so that we we 
we we know about sickleweed and we know about some other things. But you know, some of the things that I've been seeing trending upward or popping up in places they hadn't been before, there's a bunch. Okay. Um, but things like Amer cork tree, um, um, yeah, cut leaf blackberry, uh, hardy orange. Um, and then some, you know, real landscape favorites like butterfly bush and oh, Kusa dogwood yeah. and um, winter creeper, euonymus. You know, there, I can go on and on, but you know, there's there's sort of things that because we've been paying attention to it specifically for a while, and we have our database, and we know no one's reporting it otherwise. When we see it pop up, we're like, we should be interested in this. Um, you know, viburnum placatum seems to have been coming out of the blue almost no one saw it no one saw it and it's like oh i saw it at this place and the other place and a third place and a fourth place just within the last three years you know so you have a sense that it's it's really starting to pick up speed you know and it's funny you mentioned butterfly bush now that's already been banned as an invasive in oregon and i believe washington state and people Mm. are like well that's out there that's not here well maybe just took a different amount of time (laughs) to accelerate here Um, yeah you know but the you know, it's funny, and I don't know if this has any bearings on it at all, but you mentioned Amher cork tree um, and Viburnum placatum. Now, when I worked at Princeton Nurseries, which was 3,000 acres in Monmouth, Mercer, and, and Ocean County, we grew a ton of that. So when, when Princeton Nurseries shut the door, some of those fields never got dug. They just were left mm-hmm. to mature. Like you may have an entire block of Amher cork tree that was left to become a mature forest. And right. I wonder how much that has – come into play with with some of the spread of this um it's it's possible yeah absolutely i mean some of the places that are sort of the worst for a variety of invasive species have in common they were either a former landscaping um uh, former nursery Mm -hmm. or there was like even if it wasn't a business like displays and things like that. So, you know, you have Watchung Reservation, Jockey Hollow, Duke Farms. You know, when we were first starting the strike team, our list grew exponentially after working with the folks at Duke Farms. (laughs) (laughs) You know, it's like every day was, what's this? (laughs) All right, now what's this other thing? You know, and then you looked it up and then you knew it. Then you can look for it in other places, but mm-hmm. yeah, they, they obviously are infection sources. Um, yeah. But you know, once they've done that, then you know, you know the the infection, so to speak, can travel from it. Yeah, I I think this is pro- we have other questions for you, but this may be a good time to to really delve into some of the listener questions. Yeah. So, yeah. did you have an answer for the lesser celandine? Like, is that something that you know of of good removal methods? for that i was hoping hoping you weren't going to bring that up (laughs) (laughs) it's okay if you don't you know it's and and that's one thing is um if if you don't there may be someone else that does you know i'm i'm a firm believer and i don't know a lot of things but we'll find out the answer so if if you don't know we'll 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 go elsewhere and see if we can find a good answer for everyone there there is a big problem with it i mean so it comes up very early there may not be no there's There's no good answer. I I mean, I would definitely preface it with that. But quickly, I would say, you know, it comes up early. So that's an advantage. Um, It comes up in March. So you could spray the leaves of it before just about anything else has come up. So there's an an opportunity there in February, March. Um, But the problem is it's very prolific. It has multiple reproductive um, uh, uh, opportunities. um, And... Unfortunately, when it is next to a stream or something like that, if it's along the entire course of the stream and you're downstream from it, you could eliminate it from your place and have more of it the next year. Gotcha. gotcha. So it, it is very tricky to get rid of. Um, and it does, you know, opportunities created by the removal of the understory by deer facilitate it just like many other invasives. Yeah. Okay. The uh, Raquel Manella um, asked – when communicating with people who aren't ecologically minded, what's the best way to communicate the dangers of planting invasives? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I think the, the concept of the broken food web is a good one. Okay. And sort of the complement that is, you know, like the Doug Ptolemy kind of uh, rationales, you want native plants so they get eaten. So, you know, if you say, you know, when these invasive plants run amok and take over large amounts of ground, 
the food web gets broken because nothing is eating them. So nothing could eat those things that would have eaten other native plants that were there. Yeah. And then you sort of back that up with saying, and yeah, go look at what Doug Tallamy is saying, you know, about how when you plant natives, you restore the food web, you know, so some a combination of that, uh, both sides of that coin, I think is sort of a helpful way to cut to the chase. I think that's great. And one thing that we discuss, Tom and I preach all the time mm-hmm. is be inclusive. If yeah. you're doing something on your own property, include your neighbors, because it's going to be, it could be dramatically different from what their perception of a healthy lawn <laughs> is. So if if you're combative, which we've seen a lot in a lot of these native plant groups, it's it's not really the best way to grab someone's ear and get someone's mm-hmm. attention, especially if they're interested. So just be inclusive. Explain what you're doing and why you're doing it and what the benefits yeah. of yeah. it are. Um, I mean, I, I grew up in a very, you know, normal blue collar working class situation. No one talked about invasive plants or cared particularly <laughs> about nature. Yeah, you know, exactly. like, I don't I don't go into the world assuming that someone knows what I know or cares about what I care about. Yeah. You, you know, and, and you got to have a little bit of forgiveness in this crazy world that people don't know about invasive plants. It's OK. You know, yeah. and you could definitely, you know, when we do our community conservation visits, uh, it is rare that I go to someone's house that doesn't have at least one or two invasives because they didn't know or mm-hmm. yeah. the previous landowner planted them. You know, so there's no room for, you know, being angry with people that way. You know? No, no. And it's, it, you know, sometimes it's just prioritizing things too. I just recently removed miscanthus from my property mm-hmm. that had been planted there 20 years ago, you know, and it's mm-hmm. just, it, it's not that I didn't know. It's just getting around to that priority to take care of it so you know it's just prioritizing everything sometimes it's planting new native sometimes it's removing things it's it's striking that balance yeah and we actually just got another comment on that that uh, message from uh, Alyssa lewis who kind of asked a similar question just i guess a big question is do we ever get um negative feedback when we're trying to have this conversation and obviously that's a yes and it's really like we just said you got to be inclusive with the conversation and it's an education people yeah. either don't know or they're they're um i don't think many people are actually actively planting this stuff or leaving this stuff in their landscapes to be a a, a pain <laughs> they're not yeah. like actively going out oh i'm gonna plant this to piss off those native <laughs> plant freaks down the street <laughs> no they just right. they don't know and it's about education it's just including them and explaining um like we said, the the food web and and why it's such a big yeah. issue, or or offer to help if if yeah. you know your neighbor has an invasive plant and they're like I haven't gotten around to taking care of it, offer to take care of it yeah. if it's that big of an issue for you. You know, you yeah. can always help that way. Um, and we have our uh, we have our do not for sure what you just said, and and we have our do not plant list that we update every year. So you know that's something if someone wanted some backup, so to speak, if they're just approaching their neighbor and they say something, and they're like, well, what do you know? You know, like, well, okay, well, the strike team with our technical advisory committee put this thing together and you know you could sort of quote unquote prove that it's invasive so i i think one question patrick gilliam uh asked and someone else had privately asked me this question just a day or two ago but what's the best way of disposing of invasive plant debris so that you're not creating a problem somewhere else right right yeah definitely i i hear that question um i think for the most part, it's not as big of a concern as people think it might be. Okay. You know, so if you remove an invasive that's rooted in the ground, it is no longer rooted in the ground. That is a very, that's your victory. Okay. You All know, right. will, what are the odds that if you um, laid it on the ground, it would reroot really low? Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, so, um, you know, what if it has some fruit or seeds on it? You know, what should I do with it? You know, the odds of that one plant and its fruit spreading widely after it's been cut and, and, and killed or whatever yeah. are also pretty low. Okay. So, you know, I don't think it's, if you add a lot of extra, just practically, if you add a lot of extra steps to disposing of the thing, then that's less time you could spend killing more of them. Gotcha. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that's, that's the way I look at it. It's practically like, yeah, maybe there's a slim chance. Some species will sprout if you lay it on the ground and yeah, maybe some of the seeds, if there are seeds on it will grow, but just go get rid of more of them. You know, I think the odds <laughs> quantity. Are, are, yeah. Yeah. It's more about removing as many as possible and not 
spending a ton of time meticulously disposing of it. Awesome. We have two more two more listener mm-hmm. questions. Um, Skip Burns asked, other than the Invasive Species Strike Team, are there other groups that, that people can get involved with to help remove invasives? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, any any conservation group or, you know, county parks or whatever, you know, might have uh, work days and such. Um, you know, someone, something that's near where, where any particular person lives. I mean, one of the things that we've been trying to encourage um, are what we call local strike teams, mm-hmm. um, which, you know, aren't necessarily affiliated or anything like that. But, you know, they're groups of volunteers that love a particular place and have regularly scheduled work days to chip away at, at the problem over time. And, you know, we try to support them in whatever ways we can, either information or strategies or techniques or, or whatever. But, you know, if you don't have a local strike team near you, maybe you could start one because usually how they start is mm-hmm. one or two people that are interested and they say, I love this local park, um, but it's getting overrun. Let's do something about it. You know, you could, reach out to us anytime and I can share stories about other groups and how they've gone about it and their successes. That, but, that, uh, there's that's, always opportunities. That's fantastic. I know over in PA, one story that I love I, in, in Levittown, which isn't, there's not a whole lot of native or natural areas left there. Mm-hmm. There were two gentlemen that had started, um, I think it's the Greenbelt Overhaul Alliance of Levittown, and they just started cleaning up the Greenbelt areas along the creeks. Um, and deal, planting native uh, natives, taking out uh, invasives, the, the amount of – like they just realized how many tires they were seeing in the green belts and, <laughs> and old TVs and things like that. And they've removed something like thousands of tires and mm-hmm. just starting – and it was a grassroots effort that yeah. has really just exploded. So, And that's, that's awesome. an area that doesn't have a lot of natural areas um, and still doing that. So um, that's a, fan, a, a, great, a great story of uh, – a grassroots effort so mm-hmm. you can start your own uh or there's plenty of other places um, absolutely there's always opportunities and and i saved this one this is also from patrick gilliam and it's i saved this one for last because it's probably a little more in depth just how do you determine which sites or populations are worth addressing like how do you what in prioritizing how what's best to make those determinations yeah and it, it kind of depends on your scale and what you know what organization the you're in so if i said what's the priority statewide i would say how we did our u.s forest service prioritization we had gis help and things like that and we found the 10 best blocks of far contiguous forests across all of the landscape regions in new jersey okay i awesome. said that's where we want to work you know and you know within that you know you do your stewardship hierarchy you encourage your management you go after the emerging species first with few uh, individuals and then you kind of build up from there now if you want to start a local strike team you know the park that's local to you is your highest priority you know <laughs> so, yeah yeah that makes perfect yeah. sense yeah, you know, you don't you don't need you know some hierarchy at a global level. You know, is it worth really working here, given the entire globe? <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah. well, you're not working in the entire globe. You're working in a particular state or a particular town. You know, so yeah, if you had if you said I wanted to work in um, you know a particular town, you would say what are the green spaces in town, and maybe which one of those has the best mm-hmm. chance of being improved. Okay. And it's not necessarily going after the worst thing first. Mm-hmm. I think that's part of our themes is go after the best thing first and keep it good. Mm-hmm. You know, I like that, that should always yeah. be priority number one is accentuate the positive, you know, and, and then move on from there. Awesome. Awesome. I love that plan. Speaking of plans, you recently, I believe you recently completed uh, Invasive Species Strike Team 10-year strategic plan. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that, what that entailed and, and what that – was for moving forward yeah we are we we make um we made 10-year plans for all of our private uh the landowners in our forest service program okay um and you know i think a lot of that is um basically what i just said is like you know prioritizing how to prioritize um you know it's it, it invasive species work should always be looked at as you know you don't fire until you see the whites of their eyes. You know, there, there's just not enough ammo, uh, uh, so to speak. Yeah. Um, and you really have to, to be effective and as efficient as possible. 
Okay. Um, so you have to kind of know enough to know what the priorities are, what species should I go after. But even without knowing, if you see something, an invasive species, and there's only a, a little bit of it mm -hmm. at your place of interest, do that first. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, make sure a small problem doesn't become a big problem before you try to reverse the other thing, the big problems that exist. Gotcha. Um, so it's that triage approach is, is really important for any of these 10-year plans. Awesome, um, awesome. So moving forward. Yeah, so what can we do to make sure that we aren't going to lose this battle in the long run? Obviously, you find out about the invasive plants after they've already been there for a while. They usually establish a population that's big enough for people to, to stumble upon. So we're we're already behind in this this war per se. How do we make sure we're not going to lose out in the end? Yeah, I mean, I think ultimately enough people have to care. You know, that's, that's ultimately what has to happen, and that's what we work towards and others in the conservation community work towards. Um, but, yeah, yeah, there's there, there's definitely um, almost the sort of the example that popped into my head when you said what you are saying was, you know, we jumped in, the strike team jumped into the pool at a certain point in time. And when we jumped into the pool, I thought a species called Linden viburnum was newly emerging because I had only seen it in one place. Yeah. After crowdsourcing all this information for several years, we found thousands, or we, everybody collectively found thousands of populations of it. Wow. You know, so that was too late. We're, it's, it's, now we consider it widespread. Um, and there'll be other, other losses. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a, you know, it's, it sounds a depressing way to put it, but I always think of conservation as the game you win by losing less. Yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. and, you know, until enough people care, that's the situation we're in. And we need more people to care, more people to, you know, steward their local parks, um, the state and nonprofits and everyone else putting even more and more resources into stewardship. You know, that's what it's going to take. And, you know, ultimately, it's really going to take deer herd reduction. Mm -hmm. You know, if it, I don't think there would be a strike team if we had 10 deer per square mile. Yeah. So, you know, with it, it's a huge part of the puzzle and in some ways we're, we're, we're trying to um, hold something back that's inevitable until we address the deer problem and then the native species can start competing. I, I don't even know if we'd have a podcast if we had 10, <laughs> <laughs> 10 deer yeah. per square mile. Why yeah. not? And you, you've brought up uh, deer herd management, deer herd reduction a number of times. What do you advocate for as the the best route for for that to happen? We've had uh, Dr. Jay Kelly on before from Ratton Valley Community College, who's studied a lot of the deer issues in the state. Um, we had um, Kip Adams from from formerly the Quality Deer Management Association. Now it's called the National Deer Association. Yeah. On talking about using native plants for uh, deer populations, and he also talks about herd management, and that's how you have healthy deer populations. Yeah. It's not letting them overpopulate. Yeah. Um, more deer doesn't necessarily mean better deer yeah. from their aspect. Yeah. What do you advocate for when it comes to that? Yeah, yeah. It, it, so I've been involved with this issue for some time. Um, and I'll have to send you a link, but on our, the Friends of Hopewell Valley website, we put together a, a series of stakeholder slides. Okay. And I think if, if you look at it, you could – you could understand the complexity of the problem and why we have overabundant deer. And there's, you know, there's, there's different, um, you know, forces at work, societal forces at work that lend itself to the problem we have. And if we're going to correct it, all of those stakeholders have to be pushing in the right direction at the same time. Gotcha. This is not impossible. You know, it, you know, my, one of my favorite jokes is, you know, we're humans, damn it. We can make anything go extinct. <laughs> you know, you know, we, we've done it before and we could do it again. Um, you, you know, so obviously I don't want deer to go extinct, but, you know, the, the technical ability is there. Yeah. We could mm -hmm. do it. There has to be enough people pushing in the right direction for it to happen. You know, so that's landowners allowing access. Mm -hmm. And when they do allow access, have it be people that are management hunters, not going to take one buck and leave. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, you know, there has to be, you know, policies, the state level that encourage harvesting. Yeah. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of parts to it. People have to be accepting of, of deer, uh, deer management. 
uh, and understand the difference between recreational hunting and management hunting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, but we, it's complicated for sure. I mean, what, what, so in Hopewell, we've been working with lots of private landowners, you know, but there's thousands of parcels of land and every one of those parcels has a person that makes a decision about what happens on it. There's not enough people on those parcels that say, yeah, we want management hunting, you know, mm-hmm. so we're not, we're not having an impact across the 40,000 acre Hopewell Valley, mm-hmm. although we're having success and partners are having success on their particular lands. Yeah, um, but we just need more people, same as invasives, more people to know and care about it. Well, that's a, you know, without being controversial, you know, the deer problem exists because it's a problem that humans created. You know, we removed the apex predator, uh, forest uh, defragmentation. You know, we just kind of have to assume that uh, that role as the new apex mm-hmm. predator. You know, and and we created it. We should be able to fix it. It's just, I guess, it's getting everyone on that same page. But but if you can make that circle bigger. You know, we keep talking about that. It's great that we all believe in this and, and this group and we keep talking about it, but we kind of have to keep adding to that and mm-hmm. getting that outer layer of that circle a little bit larger and a little bit larger. I think if we do that, we're we're well on the way. Absolutely. Totally. So you, you brought up the Friends of Hopewell Valley open space. Now, the and, and we have to discuss this because invasive species strike team is just an arm of – the Friends of Hopewell Valley Open Space, and you're you're involved there as well. So, can you just tell us a little bit about the organization and and what other types of things you do? Yeah, so um, you know we're a nonprofit, you know local uh, nonprofit, and you know do things that like many other nonprofit conservation groups do. You know, buying land to protect it uh, from development, uh, doing outreach, uh, stewardship, uh, etc., um, and. Um, you know, I think one of the bigger relevant things that we do is the community conservation program gotcha. where we have lots of different people involved, you know, reaching out to private landowners. When I did a, uh, a stewardship plan for the entire valley, when I first started with them, you know, the thing that glared at me was, you know, I think at the time it was about 20 percent of the land was preserved and 80 percent of it was private. Wow. And I thought to myself, I could do everything perfectly on 20% of the, pro- of the valley and still the entire valley is lost. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. So again, it's making that circle bigger, like you put it nicely, and, and getting people to be involved, even if they're doing stewardship on their own properties, help them out in any way you can. Encourage people that haven't been doing stewardship to do stewardship. So, you know, part of that is uh, deer management and invasive species uh, control and planting natives for sure. Yeah. And, and it's that, that area is a, you know, it's there to enjoy and, and contribute to as well. Um, I've been to Bald Plate Mountain, which I believe is, is that property that's just managed by Friends of Hopewell Valley Open Space or property that's owned? We, it's, um, we don't have an ownership and interest and we co-manage it, uh, with the county. All right. Um, so, yeah, we work together quite a bit with with Mercer County Parks and because, you know, mm-hmm. Bald Pate, again, in the forming of priorities, which was one of your other questions. When you look at central New Jersey, Ball Pate Mountain stands out of you as being one of the biggest pieces of forest around. Yeah. You know, so we were going to take that positive and we were going to accentuate it to the extent we could. And, um, so and we do a lot a, of work there. And that's a wonderful area. And I know Sourlands Conservancy has areas they manage around that, too, so that you know, that area becomes larger as well. Mm-hmm. So it's it's there for you to enjoy, be active in helping to preserve it as well. So it's, yeah. you know, that's the benefit of it. It's it's for everything. And then you get to enjoy it as well. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you end up at, at Friends of Hopewell Valley Open Space? Well, what has been your journey in in this industry and, and ending up where you're at? Um, yeah, so I guess... Um started I, I you know majored in you know biology ecology as an undergraduate I, I'd gotten interest in it you know a little bit through childhood you know even more through um, being in college uh, so I became interested in nature and studied it then I went to work for a um, uh, super fun consultant okay so we went to all the worst places around. <laughs> um, and I think one of the things that really stood out to me was, you know, and there's nothing wrong with this before I say it. Yeah. This is about human health. Yeah. You know, I would go to these sites that had been abandoned 
by you know people after they made a mess and walked away and you see a bald eagle flying overhead and you see you know diamondback terrapins and all these other really cool things and it just sort of struck me as like we're the contaminant yeah yeah <laughs> from their point of view yeah and i you know i was more interested in you know starting out more loosely environmentally and human based and it sort of drifted to, you know, what a thing I really care about is the natural thing. So I went into, you know, went back to graduate school and um, ended up getting a job at the Nature Conservancy. And then about 15 or so years ago, I started my own business and I, you know, work with lots of different people, uh, but primarily Friends of Hopewell Valley and the strike team. Awesome. And you do have your doctorate, correct? I just want to be correct. We're giving you the, the proper, your Dr. Van Clef, correct? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't usually go by that. But, uh, yeah, as someone told me, you know, PhD stands for a phony doctor. <laughs> <laughs> that, you, you did, the, you did the time. You deserve it. So it's right, right. You know, one thing was interesting. You mentioned super fun sites, and I just found this out recently. One of our future guests on a roundtable discuss, discussion, uh, Marty McHugh, uh, former executive director of the New Jersey DEP. Uh, or maybe it was Fish and Wild, but Fish I forget exactly what his role was. But I didn't realize he was saying, oh, Superfund site basically started. That's a New Jersey thing that was mm-hmm. that started in New Jersey. And, oh, really? Yeah, and, and the, the rest of the country kind of adapted it from from models that happened in New Jersey. So I thought that was really interesting, and we're actually going to discuss that uh, Superfund site. So you're more than welcome if you, if you want to be a part of that roundtable discussion. We'd be happy to have you back. Yeah, I'm not ter- terribly steeped, and I've been to them, but I'm not terribly steeped in the <laughs> policy or, or anything. But yeah, it's all, it's all good good work, obviously. Awesome. So to wrap it up, we kind of we're down to the final question, and mm-hmm. it's it's always the same <laughs> final question. We we never change. I don't think it will ever change. But you know, because you know, we focused on invasives. The whole point of the podcast was native plants. So we're we're just curious. We're we're always curious because there's no wrong answer. What what is your favorite native plant? And I'm actually going to add one thing oh, to it all right, and just awesome. say maybe give like a top three invasive plants you want people to watch oh, out for. That's a great, great – we, um, we customize it sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'll start with the bad news first. I guess. <laughs> but um, yeah, I think I think some of those ones that I, that I mentioned earlier that are used in landscaping quite a bit and people might be considering buying them. To, you know, butterfly bush, kuza dogwood, winter creeper, uh, euonymus as three examples. Yeah. You know, I, I think we, when we see that these things are starting to go rogue, so to speak, you know, we should be trying to as quickly as possible stop helping them. Yeah. I, you know, I think the misnomer on butterfly bush, just so I don't think Budlia has, I, I don't think it's a, a great host for any, like it's, it's no, ecologically yeah, vapid. Basically. Butterflies will feed on it. Yeah, but it's not like they're. It's a primary food source. It's just, no, it's not a great. It was great branding. Native, yeah. It was it's great, great branding. branding. <laughs> <laughs> All right, yeah, so that there's, le- there's plenty of native alternatives that yeah. attract oh, yeah. lots and lots yeah. of butterflies too. So yeah. e- exactly. All right, so that was the bad news. Hit us with the the good news. What's the favorite? I I have to say there's many. Okay, but goat's rue is definitely mm-hmm. one that I like in particular. I like that. I don't think anyone has has no. mentioned that one before. Is there a specific reason that you like that one? It's just a really cool looking plant. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I mean, it, those flowers are like obviously amazing with the sort of yellow and pink at the same time, and how they yeah. change color as they age. And just, that, it's just a great plant. I, I have no idea why. I just uh, it's just something that is particularly cool. That that is a great choice. Fantastic choice. So we. We to wrap it up, we kind of always give everyone, including ourselves, a final thought. So this is where we kind of give you the floor. It could be a wrap up. It could be something maybe we didn't bring up. You could promote something. Whatever you'd like to do for your final thought, you're more than welcome. The floor is yours now. Okay. Um, I think just kind of repeating the the sort of concept that we need more people to to know and care about this stuff. And to the extent that you can and you have time and ability, you know, um, don't buy invasive plants, Mm -hmm. you know, buy native plants, uh, hook up with a conservation group and and do work on invasive control or restoration or any kind of stewardship. Um, If you can and want to, and there's a local park near you, start a strike team, 
you know, we, we just need more people to, to, to go at this problem and spread the word and do the good stewardship work. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Tom, would you like to go or would you like me to go? Uh, Fran, I have like a really, really complex and okay. like it, it's linear in my brain. I just don't know if I'm going to do it. All right. Well, mine, verbalize my, it. mine is simple. Would you like me to go while you try? Go to, and let me try and right, put it together right. a little more. And then, uh, so so mine is, is relatively simple. It's be part of the solution. Don't be part of the problem. And and that's in a lot of a lot of ways like we talked about. Be inclusive. Make that circle larger. Maybe for the holidays as an extra gift, give someone a native plant. Give someone a copy of Dr. Talamy's book or Dr. Salas' book or – Cloudy West book, like we've had many different authors, Larry Weiner, that you know, just help verse them on it. We had someone last night uh, join the Facebook group and said they found yeah. us. They really didn't know anything about native plants. Her husband read uh, Bringing Nature Home, and it kind of everything clicked for them. Mm-hmm. And now they're enjoying the podcast. Uh, share an episode of the podcast with someone. Pick your favorite one. Get them to listen to one, um, and just. Here's some of the, I think this would be a great one uh, to start with um, to get people to listen to. So, you know, don't plant, don't plant invasives, plant natives, ask the right questions, just be part of the solution. There's, there's a lot of ways we can do that, but be kind in the ways that you do it. All right, Tom. That's that's All my right. my ramble. <laughs> I'm I'm still questioning. Should I should I try and put this together? Oh, dude, come on. Should, should I come, chicken out and just no. do the the little simple thing? No, no, come um, on, come on. So Americans are very unique. Generalized Americans are very unique because of their ingenuity and in solving problems. Yeah. Um, and it really goes back to like if you look at a lot of our our I don't want to say health crisis with COVID, but um, nutritional what a lot of people call a nutritional crisis, yeah. it boils back to World War II. We're yeah. getting out of World War II. We're going into the Cold War. We need things that were shelf-stable, last a yeah. long time, because we were lo- really looking at p- yeah. a potential apocalypse. Yeah. And that's what really dictated a lot of our agriculture and food systems today. Um, and that we're, we're uh, like a Twinkie can last for 20 years yeah. or whatever it yeah. is, because we were making it so that, hey, this is food that needs to l- have enough nutrients to keep you alive, and it needs to last for a long time because you might be in a fallout shelter for years. Yeah. So much so that there started being actually nutritional crises right away um, with bread especially, and they were finding that a lot of the nutrients that were in bread when they would bleach it were being stripped away. And the American answer to that problem, oh, our kids are now having uh, nutrient deficiencies, the American answer was, hey, well, we're going to fortify it with iron and all. <laughs> we're going we're to add the stuff back in instead of not bleaching the flour. Yeah. So we're addressing the issue by adding to it instead of just ad- finding where the, the root was, yeah. the actual problem was. Mm-hmm. Um, and that kind of happens with plants, too. Like we were saying, uh, with plants, it's been, well, we want stuff that is insect resistant. And then, oh, well, we got to put down all these herbicides and pesticides and all these things to just make them so they're always perfect. And then a lot of times when we look at this problem, well, spotted lanternfly yeah. was really what kind of started this thought process, is one of the management practices, which I think is a good management practice, is since they go on the, the tree of heaven, mm-hmm. you find a stand of tree of heaven where there's also spotted lanternfly, you cut them all down and, and herbicide them so they don't come back except for a handful, typically only one or two. And then you treat that with a neonicotinoid pesticide, a systemic yeah. pesticide, so that all of the spotted lanternfly that went on there would then feed on it and they'd yeah. all die because yeah. they're uh, really not that tough. They're. Yeah. Am I making sense so You're, far? <laughs> I'm with you. I'm with you. Keep going. So, But really what I took away from this discussion is – especially in New Jersey and the mid-Atlantic Northeast, the deer issue is the problem. That's mm-hmm. what we really need to address. This is a good stopgap, and yeah. it, the, what we're doing for spotted landfly and so many other yeah. plants, it it's helping, but it's not fi- it's not the cure. Yeah. It's just fixing the symptom. It's not curing the issue and making we're, it go away. We're putting a Band-Aid on we're it. Putting, we're not, yeah, we're yeah. putting a Band-Aid on it, and it's, it's like if you're getting stress headaches and you just keep taking Advil, well, maybe try and get rid of the stress. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that was just one big metaphor for kind of what I took away. No, but I had all these like 
separate thoughts. I'm like, these all are the same thing. It's just well, trying to put we, them together. We, we, we say it all the time. Yeah. Are we asking the right questions? Yeah. Make sure you're asking. And you know what? Sometimes those questions are hard questions to ask. We yeah. don't necessarily – Tom and I don't necessarily agree with every philosophy that we approach. Mm-hmm. And not even collectively. We yeah. may disagree personally right. on every philosophy that we approach. But – I, I've come to realize as we've been doing this that there's space for all of these, and somehow they can all work together mm-hmm. just like these organizations we keep having on here. And if we can find that common ground and work together and ask the right questions, we're golden. Yeah. We should be able yeah. to and it's that. And it's thinking outside of your normal thought process. Yeah. Like I said, Americans are – like they're very um, – have very high ingenuity skills uh, as compared to other countries where I guess it's just taught that yeah. you don't think that way. But sometimes we overthink and the, the issue than yeah. doing the simple things. Yeah. And it's just seeing, you know, we talked about today all these great organizations that are working together. It, Mike, am I correct? Uh, Friends of Hopewell Valley Open Space, you're a member of the CWRP also? I've seen you yeah. at meetings, so mm-hmm. I, I assumed. Um, yeah, yep. And then you're working with Duke Farms, who we also had on. Uh, like, you look at a lot of the organizations we've even just had on the podcast. They're, yeah all tied together so. exactly so it's that's that's a great starting point so it's great that we all do it but we need our listeners to do it as well so that you know we're all part of this together we're trying to share this information and get it out there as far as we can so let's keep sounding it loud and, and letting it go like all me. right so yeah yeah, that wraps it up. Wow, we're, that was <laughs> that a great. Was, that was a long one, but it's something we've wanted to dive in for for a while now. Yes. Um. Yes. So I'm really glad we got the chance to do it. Thank you, Mike, for coming on, uh, and thank you guys for listening. Uh, we hope you enjoyed listening all about the invasive or New Jersey invasive strike team strike invasive strike team. Wow, invasive, I'm invasive now. species strike invasive team. species strike team <laughs> <laughs> and the fr- friends of Hopewell Valley Open Space. Uh, for more information, visit the uh, the Invasive Species Strike Team website, and that's HTTPS, uh, www.fohvos.info. Uh, and I think there's a Strike Team tab, tab on there. Uh, make sure you yeah. download that app, too. Um, and that was just NJ Invasives. Uh, if you search that in your, your, I guess, the Google Store or the, the Apple Store, you'll be able to find that. Um yeah, so thank you guys for listening to Native Plants Healthy Planet. I stumbled through that one. No, that's all right. That's all right. So I want to give a big uh, thank you to Stephen Marr for contributing the theme music. Um, we do have a winner for the buzz. So do, the next yeah. buzz episode, we're, we'll have new theme music for that that will be synonymous with the buzz. So mm-hmm. uh, we'll talk about that on the next buzz. You can follow us on Twitter at Pineland Nursery. Facebook at Pinelands Nursery NJ, Instagram at Pinelands Nursery, and YouTube at Pinelands Nursery. Uh, don't forget about the question and answer line. We do have uh, some questions. I don't know if I shared that with you, Tom, but Saul called oh, back. So um, I know, can't wait for yeah, that. We one. have a Saul. Uh, <laughs> so if anyone else would like to call us, uh, it's 215 346 6189. Again, it's 215-346-6189. Ask a question. Leave a comment, whether you like something, didn't like something. If we pick your question or comment, we'll play it uh, and answer it on a future episode of The Buzz. And let's not forget about the Native Plants Healthy Planet Facebook group. 25 new members this past week. Wow. Yeah. Wow, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah, so we'll keep the conversation going over there. Yeah, you can listen to the Native Plants Healthy Planet podcast directly at www.nativeplantshealthyplanet.com. And I, my apologies to Russ Finari because he does listen through the website. I've been saying, who listens yeah, to yeah, the website? Yeah, he does. Yeah. He does listen through the website. Um, but if you aren't Russ Finari, you can listen to us through <laughs> Podbean, <laughs> Apple Podcasts, um, Spotify, Stitcher, uh, really wherever you consume your yeah, podcast. Yeah. You can even ask, ask Alexa to uh, play the Native Pla- Plants Healthy Planet podcast, but you can't ask Alexa to give us a five-star review or share it with a friend. You have to do that yourself. And please do that. Yeah. Have them hit the subscribe button. That's so, huge. For getting the message out there, if, and when they hit this as subscribe button yes, along yeah. with the five-star reviews, that's a big help. Yeah. That's so fun. with that, I'm Tom. And I am Fran. Mike, thank you again. We, we greatly appreciate it. Fantastic yeah. conversation. Uh, thanks for having me. Oh, anytime. And thanks again, everyone, for tuning in. We'll see you again next time. Until then, keep it native.
Thank you for listening to the Native Plants Healthy Planted Podcast, presented by Pinelands Nursery. Remember to like, share, follow, and comment.